and boom. Hey, folks, what's going on? This is Keenan. Welcome to lesson three of Top Leaders. This Top Leaders is all about teaching you how to leverage the power of the book, Not Taught. Not Taught has 16 powerful chapters. Each uh, lesson, we're going to talk about a chapter. We're going to bring in a top leader who knows how to actually do what I tell us we need to do in the book. This week's top leader is the one and only Art Markman. Art is a genius and a true top leader in the world of thinking. Now, look, Art, thank you for coming on, man. I'm excited to have you. Oh, it's great to be back. Good to see you. Good. We're going to have some fun with this. Listen, people, I know that many of you have reached out to me and said, dude, I'm not a big fan of the think chapter. That was dumb. Obviously, we have to think, et cetera, et cetera. But the truth of the matter is, if you really let that chapter sink in and then you walk through life and you even ask yourself how you approach things, you watch how people approach things, you watch people on your team not do stuff that should be clear as day, you'll start to realize that thinking is really not that clear and obvious and most people don't do it. Am I right, Art? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Did you see the scariest movie of 2015? That would be the big short. Did you see that? No, I you got no. You got to see that movie because it's all about what happens when a whole industry doesn't think and an industry big enough to bring the entire economy to its knees when it fell apart. And and so if you want if you want any bigger cautionary tale about the danger of not thinking and not understanding what's going on in your industry, that there's no bigger tale than watching that movie because it's just it's incredible how few people were actually thinking clearly about the mortgages that were being sold, packaged, uh, put together into derivative securities, uh, and then and then even at the point where people were beginning to think that 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 the industry was falling apart, they weren't thinking clearly about what it would mean to insure those using uh, you know using these vehicles for for creating insurance against that. So the whole thing is really about a lack of thought. So it's, it's actually not nearly as obvious that people should be thinking as, as a lot of people will assume it is, because it, when you look out in the world, people are clearly not thinking. All right, so let's, let's start off and, and sort of set a foundation with people. You know, why don't people think, right? And what does that mean? When we say they're not thinking, what does it mean and why don't we think like we should? Yeah, so, so there's going to be two pieces to this. The first is a lot of the time in our lives, we actually avoid thinking by just doing things by habit, doing what we did last time. The brain, right, we, talk, we, we, we talked a while back about the fact that the brain is an energy-hungry organ, which means that it, uh, it, it, it's 3% of your body weight, uses 20 to 25% of your daily energy supply. That brain is trying to minimize the amount of time it spends on anything. Thinking takes time. It's expensive. And so what you really want to do is to rely on past experience and just do what you did last time as often as possible. That's our first problem. Our second problem is that often, rather than trying to understand deeply the way things work, which requires a tremendous amount of thought. We just want to be told what to do. We want a procedure for what to do. So think about, you know, uh, when you're, well, look, you had some trouble logging in today. So what did you do? You restarted your computer. Why? Because that might work. Did you understand? It's worked in the past. And because it's worked in the past. So did it, you know, do you understand why it worked? No, but it sometimes works. So let's try that. I consider that to be the 21st century equivalent of what my grandfather used to do when the when the screen on his TV would go a little screwy and the picture would start going up. He'd get up and he'd whack it on the side, right? I'd say, Grandpa, why did you do that? He'd say, I don't know. You know, it's, it's worked in the past. The, the problem is that if you don't understand why the world works the way it does, you can't solve new problems. So that key question that we're going to have to spend some time on is that question, why? Because if you can't adequately answer the question why, then you can't effectively think in new situations. And it turns out a lot of us are not particularly good at giving those kinds of, of explanations that answer the question why, and that limits us. Okay. So before we go any further, so now we teased everybody. All right, why don't you tell everybody why you are someone we're talking to about this. Tell us about the work you do and tell us about why you're an expert on thinking in the brain. 
Sure. Uh, so, yeah, I'm Art Markman. I am a, a, a psychologist. Uh, I, I teach psychology at the University of Texas. I run a program called the Human Dimensions of Organizations. So I teach people in the business world about people because that's one of the least well understood uh, elements of that. I have done 25 years of worth, worth of research on thinking, on reasoning and decision making and motivation, written lots of papers that get read by 30 of my closest colleagues. And starting about uh, 10, 12 years ago, I began to recognize that almost everybody I know has a mind. Almost nobody knows how that mind works. And so how can we help people to understand their minds better so that they can live their lives better? And so what, what I try to do in some of my time is to, is to give that information away. Um, I'm a blogger for Psychology Today, Harvard Business Review, Fast Company, Inc. Got a, got a radio show and podcast called Two Guys on Your Head. Seven and a half minutes of, of everything you ever wanted to know about psychology, didn't know that you needed to ask. Uh, and a couple of books, including one called Smart Thinking, um, which, you know, is directly relevant to the stuff we're talking about today. Awesome. All right, there you go, Pete. There is the background. And as you were saying that, just so you know, Art, I don't know if you know him, but a smart person in the world of thinking just jumped in, hopefully he stays with us for Tim Herson, who wrote the book Think Better. So Tim awesome. is here. So hopefully he jumps in and asks some great questions. All right, so Art, let, I want to break this down. And as I said, Taught Leaders is about helping people understand how to get better and how to actually apply stuff. So the first thing here is take a, like a 30 seconds to explain to the audience why thinking is so important to their day-to-day -day job and being successful and differentiating themselves. And again, sort of reinvent, why aren't they doing it? Or what should they look at? How do they accept they're not doing it? Yeah. So, so the reason that we need to think is because without thinking, all we do is, is to do what we did last time. And the problem is that if the world changes in any way, what you did in the past, what isn't going to work anymore. So thinking is what allows human beings to act flexibly in the world. Story I love to tell, right? Baby deer born in my front yard, because, you know, Austin, Texas, there's, we're overrun by deer. Baby deer born in my front yard. Within 24 hours, it had stood up and run off with its mom. Within a year, it was a fine, upstanding member of the deer community. Okay? I have three kids. Most of them are entering their third decade of life. They are, they are 20, you know, I got two 21 year olds, almost 22. They are still just barely getting themselves ready to enter the world and enter the workforce. Why? Because it takes two decades to program a human being to deal with the information landscape that you're going to find yourself in. If you want to be able to adapt to the world the way it is, you need a couple of decades of training. Those deer born on my front yard, they are stupid. They can't, they can't cross the street. If there's not enough food, they can't go down to the grocery store and buy anything. They don't know what to do in the modern world. My kids are figuring it out after a couple of decades. Of course, what they figured out is it's better to be on the dole, but still. Because um, so, it worked. Because it, it's worked. It's, and, and it's about to stop working for them. So... Oh, it looks like we, you froze there on us. Hope you come okay. back. There we go. So, so anyhow, so it's really important for people to think because we need to make sure that we can adapt to new situations. That's going to be the crucial bit. And so all of the thinking skills we're going to talk about today, all of those are what allow you to adapt to, to, to a changing world and to continue to do things as effectively as possible, even though the procedures you might have learned in the past aren't going to work anymore because of those changes in the world. Okay. So I, I want to suggest something, and I want you to tell me if I'm right or not even to be wrong. I want you to take what I suggest and you steer it if I don't get it right. But I right. see, at least for this discussion and, and from the book, Not Talk, I see there's sort of three areas where we, I think thinking is most valuable. One is problem solving, right? And I know problem can be for everything, but specifically problem solving. Like I'm moving along and something gets in my way, right? What? Two, innovation. I need to create something. I need to, you know, to, so what we'll call one is reaction, problem solving. The other is response to, hey, I got to, I want to create something. I want to do something new, right? And then the other one is, is more situational, like uh, something reactive, right? So, uh, something happens right away. Like in my book, I talk about the, the woman who um, was working the register at Walmart and a guy bought uh, two jugs and he, he got two feet away and he realized one was broken. So he went back to said, hey, this is broken. And the woman said, oh, pointed to the return line. 
And he's like, but I, I just bought this two seconds ago and the return line is 25 people long. I don't want to wait an hour. I just bought this. And the woman didn't know what to do. She just kept saying, just go to the return line, not processing. It's unfair. It makes no sense. I've got other options. She just couldn't do that. Right. So those are the three areas I like to talk about. Are those good or should we do something else? No, those are great. Those are great. Let's let's okay. do it. Yeah. And, and, all right. and all of them involve um, that ability to recognize what is the situation I'm in, to understand why the world works the way it does, and then to be able to take knowledge that you've got and apply it to the current circumstance. So when we take the example you gave, right? So we've got this woman at Walmart. She's been asked this question. All she knows is a procedure. You know, she's got the, she's got a rule that says if customer comes and has something to return, send them to the return line. Now, the fact that he just bought the thing three seconds ago doesn't matter because all she's got is this rule. Right. So so she doesn't have the idea of, well, all we're really trying to do is to make a quick exchange. Ten seconds before he would have been standing online, he would have said, let me run back to the shelf and grab another one. So yeah. let me map this guy back onto the person he was 10 seconds ago and and think about a different way of handling this situation. So she's got knowledge directly from her experience that would have helped her here, but she's not applying it because she's just using the procedure that she's got. So what's important to ask at some point is that question, why? You gotta step back and you gotta ask yourself, why does the world work this way? Why? How do you train yourself to do that? Let's take one step back. Because, Mark, I got to be aware. It's like, with all due respect, folks, like alcoholism or a drug problem, right? I have to know I have it before I can fix yeah, it. Yeah, right? absolutely. So, so how do I become conscious? How do you get them conscious to then ask why? Right. So here's the thing. We got a bunch of leaders listening to us today, right? These are people who are going to help the folks that they work with to work better. The, the number one thing that we have to teach them is the importance of asking the question why repeatedly in the workplace. Everyone, when, when I, when I uh, state that there's something I'm going to do, you should be asking me, why are you going to do that? And then I need to be able to explain it back to you because people suffer from what's called the illusion of explanatory depth, the illusion of explanatory depth. And the idea behind that is that we believe we understand the world better than we actually understand the world. So we walk around thinking, I get this, I know how this works. But then if I actually ask you to explain it back to me, how does this work? You, you often can't do it. You're missing key pieces of information. And it turns out the only way to cure that illusion of explanatory depth is by having to ask and answer the question why repeatedly. Now, you might say, well, of course we're going to do that, right? We should always be asking why. But here's the problem. In the modern business world, the, the question why has become an aggressive question. And the reason for that is because we all want to get along too well. So we, we, what happens is we don't want to come out and say to somebody we work with, I disagree with you. So instead of coming out and saying, you know what, I disagree, we say, well, why? Which seems less confrontational. But really what we're saying is tell me why, because then I'm going to disagree with the premises that you state. I'm going to disagree with your explanation. And what, I, what we need to do instead is to separate those things out. So we need to get people, when they disagree with you, to say, listen, I disagree. Let's talk about this. And when they want to know why, when they want to think, when they really want to understand how does the world work, then they ask the question why. Because it's only when you ask that question that we can ensure that, that the organization we work for has the knowledge that's going to allow us to solve those problems in new ways and to help to cure that illusion of explanatory depth. All right, brilliant. So now people know to be cognizant above it, of, of it. It requires leadership to remind them. It, it, it requires a culture that says, ask why. Yeah. So now I'm in that culture. I'm asking why. So now go back to your point where the woman has that information. Just to, to go get it. Yeah. Right. So so let's let's take one more thing with her, too, because you could ask, well, why hasn't she been asking why all this time? And one of the other things that we need to remember is our school system, unfortunately, systematically beats the why out of us. Right. Because 
what what we're taught to do in school more than anything else is to get decent grades. We're told that what we really need to do, because what we're rewarded for doing, is parroting back the correct answer on an exam. As a college professor, right, I have my least favorite question is, is this going to be on the exam? And I get asked that question more times than I'd care to count because students think the exam matters. And for the first 20 odd years of my career, I struggled with that question because I just I would get it would almost enrage me. And after all those years, I finally figured out how to answer that question. So now when a student comes to me, and says, is this going to be on the exam? I tell them, you know what? Yes, but it might not be my exam. Because the thing about life is you never know when you're going to need a particular piece of information. And if you don't learn it, you're never going to know you needed it because it wasn't there when you needed it. So, Amen. Amen. So, so now let's think about this, right? Now we got this woman, she's working in Walmart. She's gone through the school system and she's only learned absolutely what she needed to know. So she's not habitually asking why already in order to figure out, well, why do I use this particular procedure? Well, yeah, sure, if a, if, a, if, a, if a person comes to the store after three weeks to return something, I want to have specialists looking at that because they might have broken it at home and now they're bringing it back and that's not good for the store. But a guy who just bought something, if it's broken, that's our fault, not, not, not his fault. And, and frankly, even if it's his fault, it's probably good customer service for us to believe it's our fault. So, mm -hmm. so now the why question is, well, well, I know now I know why I'm usually sending people to customer service and why I should do this differently. But if you're not habitually asking why, because you've never been taught to do that in the schools, what do we have to do instead? What we have to do instead is to teach them in our organization how to do it which means from day one, when you onboard someone, you want to enculturate them into thinking why, that I need to be asking why, and I need to be able to answer that question why. And here's one more cultural piece that matters. We also have to make people feel less uncomfortable the first time they don't know the answer. Because, mm -hmm. because if we know that it is a common part of psychology, that there's this illusion of explanatory depth, then we also need to recognize that some number of the times that I ask you why and you're confident you start in, you're going to go, you know, actually, I don't know. And that first time that you say, I don't know, that you get a free pass on that. You, you get one free pass to I don't know, but that's your invitation to go learn it, to ask somebody else who knows it or to go look it up. And until we get people enculturated to do that, then they're just mm -hmm. going to following procedures in that more mindless way so so this idea of thinking and this being a chapter in my book is even a lot bigger than i think i realized when i wrote it um yeah. i was i in reaction to what you're saying here and dealing with people on a regular basis who didn't think having employees who worked for me who were not thinking that i couldn't rely on them to get things done because they would just wouldn't I was like, why did you do that i i did didn't you see all this information around you hello hello so, so this idea that those who do think and spend time on this become huge assets. That's right. Right? And here, you know what's interesting? I'm going to tell a quick story because you were talking about this cultural element. I think we're all victim to it. So I went back to school when I was 40, <laughs> 43 years old because I had to get my degree. I, I, I only had three credit hours left. It was stupid that I didn't get it. Anyway, so it had been 20 years since I had been in college, right? 23, 24 years. And so on the final exam, the final paper, we had to write a 25 paper on the history of China and blah, blah, blah. It doesn't matter. And I wrote this paper and I read this book and it was a great paper, right? But I only got a B. And I asked the professor why I only got a B. And he said, because all you did was basically describe what you read. Well, back when I was in school 25 years ago, that was the expectation. You had to demonstrate that you read the work and you taking the time to shed an opinion or go on some rant about whether the guy was right or not was not encouraged because what did you know? You just read the book. How can you have an opinion on the book, right? Yeah. And so I whole letter grade because I was operating from this, this, this way I was taught when I went to school 25 years, but I was mad at tell too, because, but anyways, yes. So I think that's what you're talking about, right? It's indoctrinated in us to, just right. to follow. And I'm not much of a rule follower, so my sorry ass got caught up and I can only imagine. <laughs> no. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So then with that, let's talk about that. I think the why you described is for those reactionary things, right? 
the, the flight attendant when a man comes up mad at her or, or the lady at the Walmart, those reactionary things that happen, how we have to think. Also creativity, though. Okay, right? but let's talk about that. Yes, but I bet there's more you can do. What can we do if we want to innovate? Let's say I want to create a new product. I'm thinking about a business. Um, I want to do something new, right? How yeah. do I work my brain to do that better? Yeah, so here's the thing. Um, if I want to succeed at, at, um, at, at something I know I have to do, then I have to ask why just related to the things that are part of my business, okay? But imagine for a second that what I really have to do is to innovate. So now I not only need to have really good knowledge inside of my own business, I need to have really good knowledge about a lot of other stuff too. Because when you ask the question, how do you think outside the box? The way you really do that is by drawing knowledge from some other area that nobody else realized was relevant to this problem and then gaining insight from that knowledge. So if you look at the history of innovation, so for example, my book, Smart Thinking, I start off by talking about James Dyson and the vacuum. How did James Dyson get rid of the bag and the vacuum, which is what he did? The way he did that was he knew a lot about sawmills. Now, you might say sawmills, vacuum cleaners, how are they the same? Well, it turns out sawmills generate tremendous amounts of sawdust. They suck them out of the air of the sawmill. And generally speaking, they don't have a big bag or a filter inside there. What they have instead is this big device called a, an industrial cyclone. It's kind of a kind of a, a cone-shaped device. The air comes in, it swirls around, and then it throws the sawdust to the side. It slides down into a hopper and they truck it away. OK. And what Dyson did was he realized I could make a tiny industrial cyclone inside a home vacuum cleaner. And and that would be a way of getting rid of the bag altogether. So what he did was to draw knowledge from one area to another and and a huge numbers of examples of. What do you uh, call that? What do you call that knowledge? So so what he did was he drew an analogy. Right. No, but do term like contextual knowledge or something. What do you call it? Well, no, it's, I would. Well, I would say that what he did was he had a Pardon. problem. What was that? Causal knowledge. Yeah, that Thank was you. causal That's knowledge. Yeah. And what he so he had that that answer to the question why. And he had it not just in the domain of vacuums. He had it all over the place. And then what he did with the so, so now that the people who are really innovative and we did a we did a, we've done studies and companies on this. The people who are really innovative are the ones who have a character that we call the expert generalist. And the, the, the idea behind the expert generalist is they have a few characteristics. They're high in a personality characteristic called need for cognition, which means basically they really like to think about stuff. Okay, need for cognition. They're also high in another personality characteristic called openness to experience. And openness to experience is how much do I like new things and new ideas? And, and then there's a third thing. They're not all that conscientious. So conscientious <laughs> people, they, they get a job and they want to get it done. People who are like moderately conscientious, they, they want to get done what you told them to do. But if they find something more interesting to do, they'll follow that down the rabbit hole for a while. And so a lot of these people, when you talk to them, these expert generalists, they tell you that they succeeded at their companies, not because of the system, but despite the system. So so they, they squeak by by the skin of their teeth early in their career because they don't always uh, get done everything that they're supposed to get done because they're busy learning other stuff. But then they're also the guy who's you know, and I'm from New Jersey. So you got to understand guy is a gender neutral term for me. So, so, you know, these are people who, who spend their time by the water cooler, talking to people, finding out what they're doing when they're supposed to be doing something else. And, and so they know huge amounts. And then what happens is they get involved in a conversation with somebody who's trying to solve a problem. And they're like, oh, that's just like what this other company did. Or that's just like what that guy down the hallway that you never talked to is doing. Or that's just like this other thing that I read about. And suddenly they bring these insights from one area to another and they make those combinations and they help to, to provide a catalyst for really great innovation within companies. So you got to have people around who have this expert generalist character who can help you to make those connections between the very problem you're trying to solve and, and all of this other knowledge that's out there.
so how do I, so how does, how does the listener here say, look, I'm, I don't want to go find those other people. I want to be that person. How, how can I improve? What can I as an individual focus on to be able to be more valuable in trying to be innovative or create new things inside my organization? Yeah. So the very first thing you have to do is to be willing to trade off some of your current productivity for your future mm-hmm. ability to be innovative. Because here's the thing, we, we set up organizations right now so that we can be maximally productive right now. And the problem is that innovation requires creating, you know, learning things, taking in knowledge right now that may or may not turn out to be useful in the future. And so you're making a bet that knowing a lot now will help you later to do things. And so what we need to do is to give people the time and the permission and to reward people for learning, for actually reading something and learning it and explaining it back to themselves, not just stealing a few minutes at work to watch a TED Talk or read a short article, but to actually sit there and understand it. Because I got to tell you, I hate TED Talks. And, and I hate TED Talks. I mean, I hate partially, I hate some of them because they're pure inspiration with no content. But there are some of them that have a lot of content. And so I hate them primarily because of the way they're consumed by people. So what Mm -hmm. happens is people watch one of these talks and then uh, and then they they, then they move on to the next thing. When when what they really need to do is to take a step back and say, did I understand this or did only the guy who gave the talk understand it? And if I'm going to make sure I understand it, I have to repeat it back to myself and really work through it and make sure I get it. And if there's any gaps in my knowledge that can't be filled by watching that talk again, maybe I have to go and read something else or watch a documentary or something like that and really make sure that I understand it. So okay. we, need to, we need to really give ourselves permission not to always be uh, doing things that are billable hours. Right. We have to we have to recognize that that our future innovation to, is, is built on a groundwork of learning now. Okay, so learning is huge. I, I, you know, I get it because I'm a huge I'm a huge reader. And when I read less, I feel like I, I'm not as, as, as creative. So it's interesting you said that. But outside of that, what about I, um, the idea of I read this twice. And I want to say once from Tim Hurston's book and also from Claudia Alter's Alt- Alt- although it's a new last name. I forget it. New book um, about going 10 ideas deep, right? So this idea that says, okay, uh, I want to, you know, create a new marketing campaign, or we want to create a new video camera, or we have a problem we want to solve. And these people say, okay, start listing ideas, but list at least 10 or 15 before you try to do anything. Do you buy into that? And what makes a difference in what you just said? Because it's very uh, tactical. Yeah. yeah. So, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take a step back and say, I agree with that, but um, okay. I would say that the that that so 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 actually let me agree with it first and then give you the but. So I agree with it because if you look at all of the research on creativity, what you find is that the people who have the most creative ideas are the ones who have the most ideas, right? And the people okay. who are most successful in writing books write the most stuff, and the people who write the best songs write the most songs. You know, it's it's you know, quite yeah, if if you if you're working the process the right way, you still have to do it a lot in order to make sure that you come up with something really good. So. So, yeah, absolutely. Quantity is going to matter a ton. Now, the, the but part of it is that often we get so excited about generating ideas that we don't spend enough time thinking about what I'm going to call the retrieval cue. So when when. The, the, all of those ideas are coming out of your memory. Why do they come out of memory? Because things come out of memory every time that you ask your memory a question. And you ask your memory a question by exposing it to information. So what if I say to everybody listening now, I want you to think of a birthday party you attended. Everybody goes, okay, fine. Now I'm thinking about a birthday party. That's not hard to do. That's the thing about memory. It gives you a piece of information automatically as soon as you ask for it which means if you're not currently getting the information you want, you're not asking the right question. (laughs) I love that way to say that again. Yeah. If you're not getting the information you want, you're not asking the right question, which means that you need to be spending a lot more time than you are, generally speaking, when you're being creative, 
in reframing the question that you're asking in as many different ways as possible. So we get so excited about trying to generate ideas. We don't take a step back and spend more time thinking about what is the what is the problem I'm trying to solve? What is the creative output I'm trying to get? And what are the variety of ways that I could describe this situation? Because every time I describe it a different way, I get a different set of answers that come out because memory is going to tell me different things. Which so so, so the the but part of this isn't don't don't think of a lot of things. But I think what people don't realize is that the best way to think of a lot of things is to ask the question in as many different ways as you can, because that's that's actually the major lever you have at your disposal when you're being creative is the way that you describe the problem in the first place. And the people who are really creative, they have lots and lots of different ways of, a, of getting at that problem. Right. So, and, for and, yeah. oh, go ahead. No. Uh, for example, for example, I like for example. Yeah. Oh yeah. So for example, right? Let's get back to Dyson, right? How did Dyson actually get to the sawmill from thinking about the bag on the vacuum? So for from you know, as long as there have been vacuums, the vacuum cleaner bag gets all the pores in the vacuum cleaner bag get clogged up. And so and so people have wanted better bags forever. But what everyone else did was to say, How do I fix the bag of the vacuum? The bag, yes. How do I fix the bag? It wasn't the bag you needed to fix. Right. Yeah. And so but they didn't they never got there. So they just tried to fix the bag. And then and now you got bags that unhook easier or bags with little plastic linings on the insides so the dirt doesn't stick or whatever it is. Dyson asked a different question. He said, What is the essence of a vacuum? The essence of a vacuum is it takes in a combination of dirt and air and then it separates the dirt from the air. So really, I'm, the problem I'm solving isn't making a better bag. How do I separate the dirt from the air? How do I separate the dirt from the air? And that's what that's what sawmills do. They separate particles from air, but they don't do it with a bag. They do it with an industrial cyclone. So when you ask the question a different way, now you get a different answer. So, so, so this idea of asking lots of questions, maybe this sort of a concentric circle concept here, a Venn diagram where it, it kind of lays over because I believe this is from Tim's book and Tim, um, tell me if I messed this up, but I love this idea. And one of the examples he talked about was it was a company that made water glasses, I believe, and very low margin business. And they wrapped the water glasses in newspaper. Do you know this story? Art? No, I don't. I'll go, yeah, tell so me they, about so they, so they wrapped the glasses in the, the production folks wrapped the glass in the newspaper, right? And then they, they put the glass in the thing and they ship them out. What they were learning is the people who were doing it were getting caught reading the headlines. <laughs> and it was slowing, it was slowing the process down considerably. And again, they clearly had a lot of glasses and that margins were so thin, they had to go quicker. And they were trying everything they could do to solve this problem because this was a big problem. You know, they're, they're punishing them. They were, they were saying, well, maybe we should buy, um, uh, paper without the newspaper, without print on it, but that was a lot more expensive. So it was going to drive the margins up because they were getting recycled paper. And then so going through this exercise of listing as many things as they could, one guy quipped, oh, shoot, why don't you just hire blind people? And they put that on the board and then left it alone and then kind of drifted back towards it as they kept throwing stuff out. And the answer is, well, why can't we hire blind people, right? And so next thing they know, that's what they did is they hired blind people. And then through that process, the association for the American Association for the Blind got super excited. They built relationships there. They got tons of press, you know, for, for providing the service and helping people with. And so it was a huge boom, all because they kept, like, asking what they didn't try to solve it. They just kept, at, you know, throwing out ideas, throwing out ideas, throwing out ideas, and they stumbled across this one. Is yeah. that sort of that idea of what you're talking about? Coming, yeah, keep, all the things coming together. Right. Keep, keep describing the problem in a different way. Right. So everyone's focused on. Right. So. So again, right. You've got the same thing of, well, fundamentally, people are deciding the problem has to do with the paper. Right. Well, it's yeah. it's, it's not the paper. It's the system. The system is a problem. What does the system consist of? So the system consists of of the people and the paper and the packing. Right. So you could have said, well, maybe we don't need to pack these things in paper. Right. Maybe there's another way to pack these. Right. Well, right. But another option is um, it's the person. We don't want people who can, you know, you could also have hired people who don't know how to read, you know, I mean, 
you know, that, that, that would have been another option. But the, but the whole point is what you're doing is you're looking at the whole system. And and so there's a lot of great tools when you look at, at creative problem solving and you look at, at the definition of the problem. There are a lot of tools that are like this. So one of the tools that's really cool uh, that's out there, I didn't create this tool, but I like it. It's called the YYY tool. And the reason it's a tool is because you basically ask yourself, what's my ideal outcome? And what's the barrier that's getting me, that, that's preventing me from getting to that outcome? And then why is that a barrier? Why is that a problem? And, and so you actually, you actually turn that question why on the problem itself. And you say, why, why am I even having this problem? And, and the more times that you ask that why question, the, the more of the hidden assumptions you start to uncover about why this thing is a problem. So for example, you know, you think about an example I love to use with this is you could ask, you know, think about cloud computing, right? I mean, in many ways, cloud computing came out of um, 10, 15 years ago, people would say, well, I, we have, there's three of us working on this document. We'd all like to be able to work on it at the same time. Why can't we work on it at the same time? And the, you know, so now we start asking that question. The ideal outcome is uh, we'd all be able to work on this. Why can't we do that? Well, it's obvious because the document's on my hard drive. Oh, okay. Well, why is it on my hard drive? Well, that's an interesting question. The reason it's on my hard drive is because way back in the 1970s, we had these mainframe computers where all the documents were in a central place. And you had a dumb terminal on your desk and you, you accessed the mainframe. But the network was slow and unreliable. And, and so what we and there was it was easier to create smaller computers that would sit on your desk that then and then and so we took advantage for 30 years of smaller faster computers with ever smaller and faster hard drives and memory and we optimized that and at the same time the networks finally got faster right it took a long time i don't i don't you know you're we're, you know more or less oh, yeah. another back. client server yeah, yeah. And, and so and so you know think of you remember the first time you got like a 14.4k modem and you thought you'd died and gone to heaven right <laughs> I mean, yes. you know, so, so, I mean, networks took a long time to get faster. Now, of course, we got the internet, everybody's got broadband at home. And so, and so when you look at that question of why can't we all uh, edit this document at the same time, it's because in 1975, networks were really slow. And so we went in a very different direction in, in how we went with computing. And what people basically did when they got to the, to, to, to the early aughts was to say, let's go back to the future, right? Let's, let's actually now put some of these documents back on a central server and let all of us access it because the networks aren't as slow and stupid as they used to be uh, back in the 70s. Right. So so but you only begin to realize that that was what was going on when you start to ask, why was this an issue in the first place? So so you got to You got to find those ways of reframing the problem. So talk about this tool. Why, why, why? Is it just did you just do it? There was there actually I just did an application. It. That's it. That's it. There was an yeah. actual What's, tool. That people could use. I love that idea. OK. Yeah. Yeah, it's a big, right. it's a tool in the sense that it's a procedure that you can go that, that, that you can go and use. Okay. Right. Do you know any? Do you know any sales organizations that, or any organizations in general, that use this as part of their culture, or use this as part of their their uh, process to create uh, uh, innovation or create or create new things? Yeah. So, um, you know, I mean, I teach it all the time, but you know, uh, I know Procter and Gamble uses it a lot, and uh, you know, I mean, I've I've seen it used with with lots of people who facilitate idea generation s situations, right? It's, if someone it's, wanted to make that part of their culture, how would they get that in? So people here listening, like, oh, I like that idea. So how could they use that? What could they do to try to get that into their organization and into their own day-to-day? -day? All right. So here's what we're going to do. We, we're getting everybody together to solve problems, you know? So, so, so you, you know, you want everybody doing this all the time. But the way that you model it for people is, you know, there's got to be some big problem you're trying to solve. You're going to do some brainstorming, right? So you actually never want to brainstorm. Brainstorming is a horrible way of generating ideas, but we can talk about that later. Um, okay. But but uh, but now we're getting the group together, and and everyone immediately wants to solve the problem. Okay, that's so. So now the to to critique like this immediately. What we want to do is to get everybody. Uh, uh, you know, we want to teach him this tool. We're going to say, listen, before we even start generating ideas, this is what we're going to do. We're going to take the problem. We're going to ask, what's the key 
barrier, the obstacle that's preventing us from succeeding. And now we're going to generate just lots of answers to the question, why is this happening? And understand the problem as well as possible, and then launch into trying to generate solutions for it. And the idea is what we're doing is we're modeling that behavior and then reminding everybody on the way out of the meeting, this is how you do it. This is how you solve problems before you just jump in and immediately, if it's a big problem, an important problem, you don't know an answer that's going to work right away. Then before you just leap in and try something, take a couple of minutes and, and really understand the nature of the problem first. And a you can minutes, that a couple of minutes or should that be like a half hour? I mean, a couple of minutes. Well, depends on how big the problem is. Depends okay. on how big the problem is, right? You know, at least a couple of minutes. It could be, yeah. Listen, I tell people that that think about how long you're going to spend solving a problem. Half the amount of time that you're spending the solving problems should be spent just figuring out what the problem is. Ooh, ooh, that's good. So to solve a problem, half the time of the solving the problem should be defining the problem. So yeah. here, here's an interesting question: Who's to? How do you come to agreement on what the problem is? So you can go through that why, 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 and I can almost see that takes you a place, but now all you're doing is fighting on what the problem is. Oh, that's not the problem. No, I disagree. So then, so how do you do that? That's a good thing, by the way, because if you've got a group of people and they can't, they can't agree on what the problem is, then nobody's going to be happy with the solution when you come up with it, because everyone's going to think that solution is the solution to the wrong problem, right? So, so what we need to do instead is actually that's one of the reasons you want to spend about half your time defining the problem because the often what happens is a group comes into a situation and they they believe they agree on the statement of the problem because they define that problem too abstractly so they come in with a very general statement of the problem and everyone will agree on it you can go around the room and everybody will say yep that's the problem that's the problem so then you say okay what does that mean and and then that's when people start saying they give a more specific definition. And now that's where you find all of those points of disagreement about what the problem is. Now, here's the thing. So let's get back to brainstorming because this is a perfect segue into that. It turns out that when we, we often get people together to do group problem solving. And the problem with doing group problem solving is that when groups talk to each other, they actually don't do creativity. When you describe creativity, there's two phases. There's what's called a divergent phase of creativity and a convergent phase. Divergent means we're going to come up with as many ideas as we can. Convergent is, means we're going to agree on something. And, and the key principle is that individuals diverge and groups converge. So when groups talk to each other, we each infect each other's memories. So that when we leave the conversation, we're all thinking more similarly to each other than we were thinking when we started. So we converge. We, yeah, that's the basis of things like groupthink, is that, we, is that groups tend to converge on something. So what does that mean? It means when we're trying to do anything really creative, where we're going to come up with as many different ideas as possible, we need to start by doing it alone. We need to start by working individually. And then after we've generated as many possibilities as we can, then we can start building on those and working together as a group to converge on a solution. Now, here's the thing. Let's, now let's break this down even further. If we've got a really big problem to solve, we want to start that divergent and then convergent process with the, with the problem definition part of it. We actually I was just going to say, I was just going to say that. So before everybody goes off and does their thing, don't they need to come together and do that whole problem thing together to make sure we have the same right problem? Y yeah, but actually, so here's the beauty of it. What you want is everyone first alone to write down their statement of the problem so that well, now okay. you've got as many different statements of that problem as you can. Now you discuss those as a group to figure out which one or two or five out of the hundred are the ones that seem like good candidates descript descriptions of the problem. So you, you diverge and converge on the problem statement. Then you go off and you say, okay, here's, here's our statement of the problem, or here's two ways of thinking about the problem. Now I want you to go off and think about those individually, and then, uh, and then we'll come back and we'll converge based on the amount of stuff that people came up with when they were working alone. Dude, and that's way better. Huge. Yeah, I, way better I've than never... Christ. I've never seen that ever in any type of organization. So I, I almost see this four quadrant matrix in my head, right? That says 
Everybody agrees on the problem and the solution, and that's up in the right-hand corner. Right, I see the left. Everybody agrees on the problem. Nobody agrees on the solution. I see the one on the bottom. Nobody agrees on the problem. Nobody agrees on the solution. And I said the other one that said, everybody agrees on the solution, but no one agrees on the problem. Right? I can just see that. And what you're saying is the four steps. Everybody go away and talk about the problem. Yeah. Come back. Come back as individual and, and, and get agreement and consensus on the problem. Right. Then go away and try to figure out what the solution is and then come back and try to get con- uh, con- or, or con- yeah. uh, divergence. Yeah. Yeah. Convergence. I love yeah. this. Converge, yes. Oh my God, this is huge. This yeah. is good stuff. So with that, we've got about 12 minutes left. This will be opened up. If anybody wants to jump in, I'd love to see Tim Hurston jump in. I'd love to see Alice Hyman jump in. So any of you guys, if you're interested, just click on this little button where it says open seat and ask a question of art. We'll wait to see if someone jumps in. Cue the brand, my senior sister. If you want to join us for a question, we'll tell you about thinking and thinking better and how to think better. So while we're waiting, folks, because lots of good stuff is coming up the stream. So guys, do not be freaking shy. Jump, 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 jump in. All right, here comes Alice. I knew I could count on her. All right, sister. I think I'm on. There we go. Hi, guys. Yeah. Thanks for having us on today. <laughs> What's up, a, a little new to blab, but okay. So, you know, I used to be a public school teacher and I taught small children. And then I taught teachers for many years. Now I teach at the university level and I'm teaching entrepreneurs. The cool. biggest problem is they don't know how to think. But how do you suggest we get it into the elementary school and starting in kindergarten? You know, it's just such a big problem. It's the only thing we really need to do to when they're young is teach them how to think. But how do we get it in to the school systems? How do we train teachers to do this so that we grow up thinkers versus having to bring them in and train them how to think. Oh man, that's, you know, I talk to teachers all the time. I go to school districts. That's one of the other things that I do. And honestly, one of the problems that we have is, is the, uh, is testing, right. right? It's we've, we've created an environment in which we're not teaching kids to think yeah. we're teaching kids to pass right. tests. And the fundamental problem with most of the tests that we give to kids is that they suffer from what I call the math fallacy. So in math, two plus two is four. There's an answer, and you'd better get that answer. There might be several routes to getting to it, but you'd better get that answer. But honestly, except for maybe knowing like what year the Civil War started, which isn't really that important a question in the grand scheme of things, um, most questions in, t- in topics like history don't have an answer. Right. What they have is a methodology for trying right. to understand right. that kind of work. Yeah. And, and we don't, it's so hard to test methodology. So we don't test methodology, we test answers. And politicians don't trust teachers, right? I mean, if anyone should, should be tested regularly, it's the politicians. <laughs> but, but no, we test, the, we, we, we test the teachers because we don't trust them. And, and, and that lack of trust is ultimately creating habits in kids, the end result of which is somebody like Keenan, who's a rule breaker, still goes back to school to just give the answer rather than to, to demonstrate the right. appropriate knowledge of the process. So I'm with you 100%. And the only way that's going to happen is if the politicians back off and yeah. let all of the people who actually know something about learning and thinking govern the way that we teach in the school. Well, it's the reason that I got out of the education business in terms of educating young people because it was so frustrating for me and so difficult for me to understand why in my classroom I was doing these things. I taught kids how to think. I taught them how to create, design, play, you know, figure out how to do it themselves versus always looking to someone else for the answer. But that's not what schools want. And um, your kids cannot pass the test if you don't teach to the test, unfortunately, because like you said, the test doesn't test the right things. But even the simplest, I have interns at my business every single semester. I have to teach them how to Google. Why? Because you have to know how to think to know how to Google. You have to know the question. You have to twist the question. You have to reshape the question. You have to keep trying. And I can't believe that, oh, I couldn't find it. I'm like, really? Bam, I've got it in two seconds. You didn't think. So it's I mean, really a tough one, but I'm going to jump off. So enjoyable talking about thinking well, with you guys. I really, really love it. Thank you, Keenan, for bringing it, and um, thanks, Art, for being on. Thanks, and and Al's as you're going, as you're as you're logging off there, I'll I'll tell you what you know what, what's really important to me. We don't we, we don't teach any psychology to people, 
right? The, the modern science curriculum got laid down at the beginning of the 20th century. The three mature sciences back then were biology, chemistry, and physics. And what that means is that psychology, which had just barely pulled itself free of philosophy back then and didn't deserve to be taught if we were creating a curriculum back then, the, the problem is that now the science of psychology has learned a tremendous amount and we still don't teach it. And the problem is, as I said at the beginning, everybody has a mind. Nobody knows how that mind works. And so they go about doing the things that they do in entirely the wrong way. So we need, we need to teach people more about the way their minds work. This is, I mean, this is so huge because as, as I heard Alice talk about it, as I hear you talk about it, all I can keep thinking, thinking is about all of this Trump stuff how people respond on Facebook, how people respond to political discussions. I mean, it's just, it's all my head keeps going to is how little thinking appears to be present as people argue their points about what's happening in the world and why they're voting for whoever they're voting for, why the liberals are libertards, why the cons are a bunch of idiots, et cetera. And, and I, I keep coming back to this. It just feels like we as a society, and that's every person listening here to some degree, have just abdicated this idea of challenging the environment and challenging the information that's coming into us, questioning why it's coming in, and trying to address to get better outcomes. And, and the reason this stuff is so difficult, Kim, you're absolutely right. The reason this stuff is so difficult is because every problem that is easy to solve, we've solved already. If, it, if, if the problem that you're facing involves mm -hmm. just a single thing to solve it, we've probably figured that out already. A lot of the problems that, we, that we're struggling with now are what we could think of as system-level problems, where what I'm supposed to do for any individual to help them depends on their circumstance, depends on the situation that they're in. There isn't a single thing that we could do that would solve the problem, right? Yeah. And, so, and so then when... when when, whenever there's a system in place, now that's when that causal knowledge becomes really important because, because ultimately the issue is, um, I always talk to people about, they ask me a question, I always play the game, ask the psychologist, people ask me a random question, and usually the answer it starts with, it depends. Yes, I said it all and the whenever, time, all the time. And, wh and whenever, whenever that answer starts with, it depends, it means you need to know a lot about the situation and the environment before mm -hmm. you can implement mm -hmm. a particular solution. And every problem that we face as a nation and every, almost every problem that every organization faces is an it depends problem. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so that requires huge amounts of thought and a lot of work and nobody wants to do that. Okay, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go a crazy place. And you tell me if I'm just fucked or it's actually interesting. Because it, a lot of this keeps coming back to the idea that there's some cultural challenges. Alice did a great job bringing this up and, and, and her question to you did a great job answering it, right? So as, as I start thinking about, uh, my head goes everywhere. As I start thinking about this, I start wondering how, Alice had made a comment about people don't want to be questioned. They feel it undermines their authority. So then that got me thinking, right? And I thought to myself, how much of this, this issue about asking why is being aggressive, as you said earlier, or the question undermining authority, how much could this come from our cultural roots in Protestant ethics? And the idea that said you had a central figure, a set of figures that were driven on faith, and if you deviated from that, you were a heretic or, or those types of things, right? Am I just grasping in left field? Could some of this... this the stuff we have that you have to measure everything that you don't question, how much of that could come from this idea of our Protestant ethic in this Mac Weber shit? And the well, I would, yeah, well, listen, I, or, or, or at a minimum, we have a society that, that still has high, I mean, most, most human societies have some hierarchies in them. And, and whenever you've got a hierarchy, right, then, then you've got some people who at the top who have more power. And if you got more power, the one thing you want is to maintain that power. And, and of course, you know, one of the things that happens is the more you start asking why, at some point you start asking the real why question, which is why do you have the power? <laughs> and, okay. and that's, that's a bad question a lot of times, right? I mean, you know, for the people in power. So, so yeah, I think, I mean, I think it's, it's, it's not just, I think, you know, you don't see this just in product, you know, in, in, in the U S you know, that comes out of our culture. I think it's, it's any time that you have, a disparity between the haves and have nots, right? If the haves are employing the have nots, then um, training them and in control of their education, 
then then you you want to think about this, right? I mean, education is partly to teach people to think, but the fact is, it's also partly to create citizens of the society that you're in, and so you know, citizen. You know, the goal of citizenship is partly to 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 uh, obey the social structure, mm-hmm. and to the extent that 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 someone might feel like you could overthrow that social structure if you start getting too smart. That's a problem. Interesting. Interesting. So it's almost this this constant tension. Because, I mean, look, I, there, there is some validity to that statement, right? I mean, when people start throwing out, uh, I'm a libertarian or I'm an anarchist, I just chuckle at them. Because those all sound great when it's just you and maybe two friends on an island, right? But you can't be yeah. a libertarian because the minute my desire and need to do something conflicts with yours, someone's going to lose. And I can't, we both can't be libertarians. Oh. I, you're only a libertarian until you're having a heart attack, and then you're calling 911. Yes, I mean, yes. come on. Yes. Or right? You're only a libertarian until someone else with a competing interest who calls themselves a libertarian tries to take your liberty away over their liberty. So, yes, that's my sort of my point here is this idea that there is some tension that we have to have in society to make it work. So where is that line, right? Where, how do we allow people to be massive thinkers, creative thinkers, but at the same point don't undermine the social structure that keeps us together? Well, and that's actually the fascinating thing to me is this is, I think, why we have such a range of personality characteristics in our population. So if you think genetically, genetics is really good at stamping stuff out that nobody uh, that, that's not good for anybody. So to the extent that we have a range in things like conscientiousness, for example, and conscientiousness, you know, co- governs this idea of how rule following you are. The reason there's a range is. We all follow rules to some degree because we have to, because society falls apart if nobody follows any rules. But we differ a little bit because we always want to have some people pushing the boundaries so that there's some innovation Mm -hmm. and some people who are so bound to the rules that they're pulling people back a little bit so that we don't constantly have a society that's wavering all over the place. Right. So so whenever we see variation in a set of personality characteristics, part of what that's telling us is that that variation is healthy for a normally functioning society. All right. Good. All right. That was helpful. So last comment I want to make. This is from Tim Hurst. And I want your thoughts on this. Tim couldn't jump in. Tim, I know you're listening, buddy. You're going to come on and do one of these things um, down the road as well. So work with Kiki to get this done. But what he says, he says that uh, for most people, it's more important to be right than to think. How many things have we missed? Oh, I just lost. How many things have we missed in life because we had to be right? Can I think oh, it's yeah. more tactical? When you answer this, act, answer it in a tactical sense as if you're talking to one person. So when we leave yeah. here, folks can walk away and do something with that. Yeah. Three of the most important words you can ever use when strung together in life are I don't know. Okay, and so the the fundamental problem is, particularly when you get into a position of authority, is is you don't want to admit you don't know something, and often you don't like to admit that that you were wrong. But actually, saying I don't know is often more important than saying I was wrong, because a lot of times you engage in a really bad course of action because you were just afraid to say I don't know. And I think that that if we were much more willing to admit when we're ignorant about something, that that is so helpful because what it allows us to do is to then go and fill the gap in our knowledge, learn what we need to learn. So, So to me, I would say as a leader, when somebody asks you a question and you're not sure, you model that behavior for the rest of the organization. You say, you know what? I don't know. I'm going to go find out and report that back to you. I'm going to send an email around or we're going to have a meeting and I'm going to explain it to you. And you're modeling the right behavior. And it's, it's, it's important both to admit the ignorance and to fill the gap. To me, that's, that's critical. And that's the, the healthiest functioning organizations are the ones who are run by people who are willing to admit when they don't know something. Ah, oh, I mean, that is a great way to end this. I really appreciate it. Folks, I hope you guys got something out of this. I know this is a very difficult topic to cover. I mean, again, it, it kind of goes against our cultural norms. And we're trying, I was trying to make Art do something. I was trying to make him give you tangible, bite-sized things that you could go apply tomorrow. But as he's demonstrated, it's a lot more complex than that. But I got some really good things to take away from. One is I don't know. One other one is to ask why a lot more often. Another one is to try to identify the problem and to identify myself and with the group. So these are a lot of good things that I've taken away from this. And I think I'd like to end in closing and then and Art, I'll give you the last word. Look, folks, 
I can't describe to you how important thinking is to your success. I know you think you think, but you don't. And you need to really start asking yourself, how is my skill of thinking? Because thinking is a skill. And if you don't believe that, you're behind the eight ball. So where is my thinking skill? How much time do I spend on thinking? How am I honing that skill? What have I read, as Art said, to understand how the brain works? If I say the amygdala, and that doesn't mean anything to you, that probably means you don't know much about thinking. If I say the ACC, the anterior circular cortex, I think I got that right, and you don't know what that means, you probably don't know much about thinking, and you need to. So take these things, folks. Embrace is a powerful skill. If you read not taught us because you want to get to the next level in uh, the 21st century, and thinking is ever more important because we don't have the rope jobs like we had the industrial age. People are no longer willing to tell you how to do it. Come work for me. And I've had people leave in a few weeks because I won't tell them how to do it. I don't have the time. You have to think and figure it out. So with that said, if you want to be successful in the 21st century, grow your thinking skills. I leave it to you, Art, to end. Thank you so much for coming. You were stud. What are the last words you'd like to drop on us? Keenan, thanks so much, man. It was great to be here. Your book's fantastic. You know, if people want more on the thinking stuff, I got smart thinking to, to help shore up that piece of it. Um, and also, you know, I'm on a mission these days. I got this podcast, Two Guys on Your Head. We're having a great time out here in Austin. We're trying to spread it to the world. So, you know, pay attention to what Keenan's doing and then pay attention to Two Guys on Your Head and all is right with the world. But thanks, man. It was great talking with you today. You got it. We'll share all that stuff. Some people have already. Kira, would you put it on here? Uh, you'll hear it on the podcast. Uh, on our podcast, guys, go to iTunes, subscribe to uh, a sales guy for this, and subscribe to Two Guys on Your Head. Art Markman, you want to follow this stuff. It's really, really good stuff. Again, it's going to grow your causal knowledge. It's going to help your ability to think, and that's going to help you win. Yeah. So on that, awesome. thank you, everybody, much for joining us on Lesson 3 of Top Leaders. We talked with Art Markman today on how to improve your thinking skills. Get thinking, people. It's going to matter. So until next time, y'all, I really appreciate it. Peace. I'm out. Awesome.